uh, because it was at the time a series of lectures like this one in the in view of the important uh, presidential election in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Anticipation. This will be a very important election, as you know, for the democratization of Mexico. And then uh, Jorge was uh, uh, appointed Secretary of Foreign Affairs of that innovative Mexican government. We met there also when I was teaching there for a while. Uh, but Jorge Casino is first of all an academic, and as such, we have invited him today. Uh, he's now a global distinguished professor of political science and Latin American studies at New York University, where he came from today. And he's the author of many books. Just half a minute, I would like to mention two that would be my favorite ones. One is about uh, the last one, you know, the big finger, which was a traditional way of appointing the candidate for president by the ruling party, the PRI. Uh, and the book uh, in English has the title How Mexican Presidents Were Chosen, a Seamus La Herencia. I think it's the definitive study of that important device in the recent history of Mexico, uh, which may uh, have some reverberations still today. And the other book that would be my favorite is titled in English Mexico Mañana Forever. Uh, I think in Spanish it's something like a Misterio de los Mexicanos. And my modest opinion is one of the most clear way and insightful studies about Mexico, about that mystery, which is uh, much to say because there is a lot of things to read about it. So the session the social today, as you know, is a good focus on the coming presidential election. Uh, it's planned for 60 minutes, will be split into three thirds. So Jorge Casanilla will speak for about 20 minutes. I will ask him a few questions for about the same period. And then the last, the third third would be from questions for you. Thank you. So join me, please, in welcoming back Jorge Castañeda to Georgetown. Gracias, Josefi. Gracias, Alejandro. Thank you for having me back here. It's been a long time. Um, here? Okay. This one doesn't work. No. Okay. So, we were supposed to speak about the upcoming presidential elections in Mexico next year. As many of you know, I'm sure they will take place uh, in early June, one month before the generally. Uh, accepted date for Mexican elections, which traditionally was the beginning of July. The interim period has been shortened in Mexico also, so the new president will take office, will be inaugurated on uh, October 1st, as opposed to December 1st. So that shortens the transition period between the election and the inauguration by uh, one month could have been more, but that's what they were able to agree upon when they legislated this. Um, right now, it would seem there could be changes, but right now, it looks like there will be, it will be an election, a race between two and a half candidates. And so you would ask me, how can there be half a candidate? Well, because either of the possibilities, in addition to the two women who are running and who are the main candidates, uh, really don't amount to much more than half a candidate, uh, because uh, that's all they're good for, either of the two possibilities, and I'll come back to who they are and what they represent. Uh, of course, the most uh, notable feature of this election is the first notable feature, there are many, is that for the first time, uh, two women will be confirmed, and since by definition one of those two is going to win, um, Mexico will have at long last a uh, woman president. This is a big deal for Mexico. It's not such a big deal uh, in Latin American terms. 
Mexico doesn't care a lot about Latin America, as Alejandro well knows. But um, actually, many countries in Latin America have had women presidents going back to Yoleta Chamorro, Chamorro, Nicaragua, 1990. Uh, and of course, Brazil, uh, Chile, Peru, right now, uh, Panama, etc. Many countries have had women presidents. Mexico actually arrives a bit late. But in any case, uh, this will be an important innovation, an important new situation that we're, I think, all excited about, and it will represent something rather uh, earth shattering for Mexico, even if, as I say, it's late in the day. Uh, the second important feature that I would want to stress is that this will not be uh, an election, let's say, uh, between two candidates on an equal footing. Candidate A and candidate B, who have the same resources, the same media time, the same exposure, the same uh, uh, possibilities of winning, etc. No, this is an election between an opposition candidate who has at her disposal the resources and the possibilities that the law allows for, which are not few, but that's it. And the government's candidate, the machinery's candidate, the state's candidate. This is an election between an opposition on the one hand and the government and the president and a popular president who knows how to use the state machinery on the other hand. It's not a simple election like we've had in Mexico before, the last uh, 20 years, or like uh, there will be, well, there was, let's say, in 2020 um, in the United States, when the incumbent was not, well, the incumbent was running then, but even then, uh, here in the United States, despite some privileges uh, due to incumbency, uh, nonetheless, there are enough rules and regulations that have to be respected that you can't uh, really abuse the office of the presidency except on the margins. It happens, but it's on the margins. In Mexico, no. Uh, López Obrador knows how to cheat, and he will cheat uh, significantly. He already is cheating and will cheat much more in the sense that he will put all of the resources of the government uh, in the hands of his candidate, uh, Claudia Sheinbaum, the former mayor of Mexico City, and she will either win or lose, but she will contain them. She will run with that advantage from the outset, from the get-go. So this is a second important feature of the election, which I think is very, uh, it's impossible to, to underestimate how much this matters. It doesn't mean that it's, that's the ball game. Uh, my friend Guido was here and I participated in Fox's campaign in the year 2000 and a little bit before then. And uh, what that campaign proved, regardless of other things, is that the opposition can beat the system when the system is weakened and when the opposition is uh, united and intelligent and skillful. Uh, whether that is the case this time around or not, we'll see. But in any case, it has been done in Mexico at least once. And it has happened in other countries under similar situations. Um, some of you may recall or you don't, not recall, but in any case, you may have read about, for example, what happened in Chile in 1988 with the uh, plebiscite on Pinochet, and then in 1989 with the election of uh, Patricio Erwin against Hernandiji, who had all of the support of the Chilean dictatorship at his disposal. And he won, Erwin won, by a proper margin, not enormously, but he won. So it can be done. It doesn't, I don't want to give you the impression that simply because this is a un elección de estado, as we say, uh, that by definition it is lost to begin with. That's not the case. So where do things stand right now? Uh, very quickly, 
Claudia Sheinbaum is the president's candidate. He chose her. Um, he nurtured her from the very beginning. Uh, he was his candidate from the first day he was in office, if not from before. Um, she um, has the advantage as a candidate of being uh, very structured, very disciplined, very hardworking. Um, in general terms, she unites, I wouldn't say the party, Morena as a party, because really Morena as a party doesn't exist that much, but she unites the movement behind López Obrador. Uh, there were very few people, except for Marcelo Obrador, who we'll get back to in a moment, who objected or who disliked her candidacy. Uh, when it was announced that it was practically everyone in Morena agreed to that. Uh, that doesn't mean that every decision she makes will be popular with Morena during the campaign, and she's already facing important uh, obstacles and complications. But nonetheless, she is, I would say, a consensual candidate within Morena, and that is an advantage for her, in addition to being hardworking and disciplined, structured. And she has a tendency to... Uh, listen to people around her. Not, I wouldn't say, tremendously open-minded, but as Mexican presidential candidates go, and I've known a few of them, she tends to be uh, rather open-minded in terms of listening to people, perhaps not exclusively from her inner circle. Her disadvantages are also quite evident. She is not a particularly charismatic or attractive or a um, simpatica candidate. She's not. In person, she can be charming, like practically all of us, except for myself, but other, everyone else can. Uh, but uh, in her public persona, really, she is not someone who draws enormous applause lines or makes everybody happy or is tremendously charming or charismatic. And, and that's an issue. That, that's a real matter. Uh, the question of being a woman or not has become a moot question since the two are women, so it, it doesn't make any difference. She has one important disadvantage additionally. She's from Mexico City. Now, those of you who are either young or not Mexican don't necessarily remember this, but there really hasn't been a president, a Mexican president from Mexico City since Lopez Portillo. Um, De La Madrid sort of made up um, well, it was partly true, partly not that he was from Colima. Salinas invented completely that he was from Agualeguas in Nuevo León. Uh, Cerillo was kind of from Mexicali. Yeah. He actually went to live in Mexico City since I think he was 15 or something like that. But, well, Fox was from Guanajuato. Calderón was from Michoacán. Peña Nieto was from the Estado de México. And López Obrador is from Tabasco, unquestionably. As they say, there's an, old, there's an old saying in Tabasco, you can take López Obrador out of Tabasco, but you can't take Tabasco out of López Obrador. Uh, Mexicans don't like Chilangos. I mean, I think this is a pretty categorical scientific statement. Uh, and it's a problem. It's an issue. So those... Well, there is a third issue that women, being a woman, doesn't count anymore. Being Ch Chilanga does count. There are people who say that being Jewish is a disadvantage. I don't think so, but it's hard to say. Once a campaign gets underway, and for example, given now what is happening in the world, hard to say whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage. It could turn into a handicap. It could. <laughs> Tochil Galvez has a series also of advantages. Her main advantage is her own persona. She is, the message is the messenger. Uh, and I think this really is what makes her such an outstanding opposition candidate. She has a story, a history of coming from very humble origins, being of indigenous origins, of having really come up from way down in the social strata uh, of being a self-made woman, 
first made a career and successful businesswoman, then a successful government official, then a successful senator. Uh, she is someone who can really, she can point to herself as an example of what every Mexican would like to be. Mexico is a highly aspirational, Mexican society is a highly aspirational society, and she reflects that aspirational nature perhaps more than anyone else has in recent times. Um, she's also very quick on her feet. She is very charismatic, very attractive, is muy simpatic. Uh, some people dislike her uh, excess, her language on occasion. She may let a few words uh, get out of hand. Uh, on occasion, she's a bit awkward on her feet, but in general terms, she's a very attractive candidate, and that's a big deal. Her weaknesses are, before I run out of time, her weaknesses are, firstly, uh, the parties that support her. Uh, this, uh, on the one hand, is a success story, the fact that PRI, PAN, PRD, plus a bunch of citizens groups were able to come together and unite behind a single candidate and more or less uh, do so enthusiastically is a big deal in Mexico. We are not a particularly, we are very highly divisive society and country. We like to uh, fight uh, among each other. And uh, uh, it's not easy. It was not easy for this to happen. It happened. But nonetheless, these are three parties who are not terribly prestigious or credited um, in the population. People don't like the PAN, the PRI, or the PRD. The PRD, there's not much to like or dislike. There just isn't much there. As they say, they fit in an elevator, elevator, small elevator. Um, the PRI and the PAN will are legitimately or not legitimately, but disliked. They are disliked for different reasons, regardless. So there's the issue of their discredit, and there's the issue, nonetheless, of their division, and the fact that Sochi is not a party member. She was elected to the Senate and to be mayor of one of the boroughs of Mexico City on the PAN ticket, but she has never been a member of the PAN, and the PAN does not see her as one of their own. But the PRI tends to see her as either a loose cannon or a panista. So it's, it's not easy. She, this is a structural problem that who, whichever candidate would have been chosen by the three parties would have more or less the same problem or a similar one. She is not a party person. That's one of her advantages. She can say, honestly, uh, I am not part of the Mexican partidocracia, but that has its disadvantages also. Um, right now, what do the polls indicate? The last I heard, uh, uh, Xochitl zone pol polling has her between 14 and 16 points behind. A financiero Alejandro Moreno poll, phone poll, not terribly reliable, had her down by 18 points, I think, last week. That's where the numbers are, more or less. A little bit more, a little bit less. That's more or less what the difference is. To conclude, the third party possibility, uh, there is a small party in Me Mexico called Movimiento Ciudadano. Those of you who are Mexican have heard of them. It belongs to Dante Delgado, and I, I emphasize belongs to him because he owns it. It's his. It's like a car that he, he has one car, he has another car, and he has his party. It has a dog, too, I think. It's sometimes difficult to distinguish between the dog and the party, but anyway. Uh, so uh, he has to make up his mind what he wants to do. He doesn't have a lot of time left to make up his mind. He can A, decide to ally himself with the opposition and support Xochitl, highly unlikely, not impossible, but highly unlikely at this stage. It's a bit late for that. B, find a candidate other than himself, and there are two the former foreign minister, Marcelo Ebrard, who was in Morena, who lost out to Xochitl, and who uh, has made his career of being uh, indecisive. That's what he does in life when you know you have to put profession 
undecided and the indecisive, both things. Um, or the current governor of the state of Nuevo León, Samuel Garcia, is a very young, quite charismatic governor, perhaps a little frivolous, a little bit uh, uh, lightweight, but he seems to want to run. Both of them have serious problems in becoming a third-party candidate, which means it's not impossible that Dante Delgado himself will be Movimiento Ciudadano's candidate. In the three cases, it looks, it seems difficult if you look at the polls for any one of the three to be much better than 10%, probably only 7 to 8%, and maybe even less because with time, as the election day gets closer, there tends, you know, strategic voting happens. And people, when they see this has happened many, many times in the United States, uh, third party candidate like uh, Robert Kennedy now starts off with 10, 15, 20% of the vote. But at the end, people decide that voting for them is throwing away their vote. So I doubt that Movimiento Ciudadano will get more than 7 or 8%. That would be my sort of forecast right now. They take votes away from, hard to say, probably more from Sochi than from. But not much more. If it's eight uh, that they get, maybe five from Sochi and three uh, from Claudia, but not seven to one or eight to zero. I, I don't think so in any case. Would it make a difference in a very tight election? Yes. And I'll continue with the questions, not the answers. A, if Sochi wins by a couple of points, 51-49, let's say the third-party candidate disappears or doesn't run, whatever. She wins by a couple of points. Now, Lopez Obrador accepts the result. Big question. Secondly, if Claudia wins, will Lopez Obrador just go home and let her run the place any way she wants, feels like uh, running it? If you like, I'll not, I won't answer right now. I'll uh, hear from you what you think, and we'll continue this discussion with Jose. Thanks a lot, and now we'll turn it over to our discussion. No, great. Uh, for me, it's maximum. Just a different question before going to the elections, because uh, you are an academic most of your life, have been a politician for a while, then my question is, what did you learn from politics in your practice that you didn't know from the academia? I mean, something, uh, sources of power that the academia will misunderstand or underestimate or neglect, how politicians make decisions, uh, something that surprised you, you have to learn and to adapt to. Uh, in, in Mexico, well, in Spanish, I think, but in Mexico, we have a saying, uh, some will hopefully help me translate it. Uh, and yes, it's a, it's a big difference uh, for all of those of you who understood. It's a big difference. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the main thing I learned, and I'm not sure I really learned it, <laughs> is that when you are in office and you have a certain amount of power, but the other guys have a certain amount of power also. Um, you come from academia and you don't know expect or assume that they will fight back. And they do fight back. In other words, it's, you're, not, you're not in target practice, okay? You're not shooting at cans or at beer bottles. You're shooting at guys who shoot back. Figuratively and literally. I'm not referring to the literal part because I didn't have any guns. That wasn't my job. Uh, but it's figuratively, yes, they do fight back. They do shoot back. They do punch back. They do punch back. And you're not used to that coming from an academic background or even from a sort of public intellectual background uh, because you're... You know, Kissinger always used to say that uh, academic infighting is much bloodier and uh, 
acid and than anything else because there's so little power at stake. Uh, so well, there's little power, so you have to make a big fuss about it. But when there's a lot of power at stake, it's also pretty rough. And I certainly didn't expect that to be that constant and that strong and that so difficult to resist people fighting back. Yeah, that's, very, that's very interesting, really. Uh, let me address uh, at least one issue that is going to be important for the election and for the future president and the relations between Mexico and the United States, which is migration. Okay? So it's about 10 million adult Mexicans living in the US. Uh, more than half of them are undocumented. Uh, it's another word for this, but I think we can keep it. And then when you were Secretary of Foreign Affairs, you tried uh, an acuerdo integral, right? I remember you said uh, the whole enchilada, right? Which included uh, uh, legalization of the immigrants, uh, documentation of the immigrants, a uh, path to citizenship, uh, larger quotas for new immigrants, not only workers in the agriculture, etc. So do you think this kind of agreement uh, is going to be a priority again, or is still is? Uh, what's the, in your guess, the likelihood that could be easy, more easy or more difficult to reach it than it was before? Well, the, the first thing I would emphasize is that, well, there are very few things that I agree with uh, Lopez Obrador on. On this matter, his positions are practically identical to Fox's in the sense that there has to be an overall agreement on immigration with the United States that includes these two aspects. And the third one that we mentioned back then, and he emphasizes a lot, which is uh, American investment or credit or whatever you want to call it for the sending regions, uh, zonas expulsoras, um, whether they're in Mexico or in Guatemala, El Salvador or Honduras. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think the, the López Obrador in a sense has vindicated what we tried to do because he's still trying to get it done 20 years later. He's not making any more progress than we did. Uh, but he's still trying, and I think that is uh, noteworthy and very positive. I also think that uh, Biden has wanted to do the same thing with the Menendez proposal at the very beginning of his term, but didn't go anywhere, like uh, Bush uh, was unable to get it through the House. He got something approved in the Senate, and then Obama got something approved in the Senate, and they didn't get it done in the House. Obviously, Trump didn't even try, and Biden has failed in his first term, at least. Uh, is that still really on the agenda? It's not a campaign issue. It's very important, particularly for those of you who are Mexican or of Mexican descent here today and uh, who may not have the constant contact with Mexico with back home. Mexicans do not care about immigration, okay? This is not something that any Mexican cares about. This is somebody else's problem. It's the problem of the Mexicans who leave. They left. That's their business. Um, the Hondurans, Haitians, Cubans, Venezuelans, all of these people, that's the we don't want them here. If they're here, what we want them is to get out of here as soon as possible. And if they stay here and people mistreat them, well, that's just too bad. I mean, it's a very crazy attitude. It's it's a little bit absurd, but that is, I think, overwhelmingly most Mexicans' attitudes are toward immigration. So it will not be a campaign issue. There will be episodes, obviously, if there's another uh, tragedy like the one in Ciudad Juarez where four or 40 uh, largely Venezuelans were incinerated by the National Migration Institute. Um, well, that would be a problem if something like that occurs again, but it will be a blip, not more. It's not a campaign issue. Um, the next government will obviously have to deal with it, uh, especially if, God forbid, uh, Trump is elected. That, that would obviously be a, a major, major challenge for the next Mexican president. Okay. <clears throat> 
I just you make me remember that I, I was shocked when I was there that the PRD, the PRD, the PRD was in his in its program uh, promised a train bala a bullet train to send the immigrants to the US so everybody let them go no que se vayan that's the kind of paradox no for a country that uh, be proud of itself well, let me say that another topic, which is important also, I don't know for Mexicans, but is, uh, uh, I mean, the relations between the US and Mexico, the narco traffic, which now is called more uh, organized crime because precisely is beyond narco, uh, narcotics. Uh, so it's about the economy, uh, food and transportation and many things. There's some estimates that might cover perhaps 20% of the country's economy. Yeah. It includes, well, some estimates, it's difficult to measure that, but it comes together with violence, of course, hundreds of thousands of deaths every year. It comes together with uh, corruption, especially in, border in the border states, right? So what would be the way to address the issue? Because, uh, so uh, should we do like something like in the US in the 1920s, like ending the prohibition? So, uh, which was also a source of economic trouble and corruption and violence, so the same thing, no? And then it was kind of first legalization of some consumption and, uh, and regulation of con on production and, and uh, trade, right? Is this kind of agreement thinkable? About, so it's conceivable that could happen between Mexico, the US and possibly other Latin American states. Uh, meanwhile, if this is not yet happening, should the next Mexican government increase its resources in public security and crime persecution, including the judiciary? Is that a priority? Well, it, it's, it's, it's two different questions. I, I think it's still very difficult to reach any kind of agreement with the Americans on legalization. Less difficult than it was, certainly, but still difficult. Um, even a guy like Biden who really was, is favorable uh, to uh, at least uh, uh, legalizing marijuana at a federal level, has not even attempted to do it. Uh, let's the states do it. Mm -hmm. I think Ohio yesterday yeah. uh, voted in favor. Mm -hmm. see, uh, so, but at the federal level, Biden has not really done anything in that sense. By the way, Lopez Obrador hasn't either. Uh, there is a certain, there's been a certain legalization in Mexico thanks to a Supreme Court ruling from six or seven years ago, but it is has not been uh, legalized uh, legislatively um, uh, because Lopez Obrador and his party have not wanted to legalize it. So I think that reaching any kind of agreement with the Americans in the short term is very unlikely. So then the issue is what the hell do you do with this mess? which is an enormous mess for Mexico and also for the United States, but of a different nature. Um, for Mexico, I think the first thing to do is to stop uh, carrying out this war on drugs, which has now been going on since 2007, or war on organized crime, uh, but stop it not unilaterally like Lopez Obrador sort of did. Didn't really do it, but he sort of did it. In other words, trying to reach some kind of accommodation with the cartels, but without asking tacitly or explicitly for anything in return. And so we almost have the worst of both worlds because we don't have Calderon's war which was crazy and murderous and bloody and totally your choice, but bent, make a real bent, at least in the setas and the Cartel del Golfo, etc. Cartel del Golfo. We have neither that nor a full accommodation like we had in Mexico for 50, 60 years, because Lopez Obrador doesn't, didn't ask them for anything in exchange for abrazos y no balazos. He said, okay, abrazos and no balazos, which really, it's not really true, but it doesn't matter. Let's suppose it's partly true. He did the same thing, okay, claro, you guys abrazos y no balazos. Well, that didn't happen. 
But we spend more on security, absolutely. We spend well under, I think it's 0.6 or 0.7 of GDP, Alejandro will correct me, on security in general, which is about a third, uh, a third of what most Latin American countries spend. I think they're mostly at around 2%, 2 to 3%. We are well under 1%. Army and Navy and police and municipal police and state police. I mean, yes, we should spend more. Now, just spending more is not going to make a difference. You have to decide whether uh, where you want to channel that money. And this is an unending discussion in Mexico, and we have it all the time whenever there's an incident or something. Oh, we should put more money into the municipal police and train them and arm them and dress them and teach them how to really write, blah, blah, blah. And, and then you look at the tax situation and you rapidly conclude that that's not going to happen. Okay, well, let's do it with the state police. Policias estatales. Let's give them money. Why should we give them money? Why don't, doesn't each state give them money, right? Well, no, because there are no state taxes in Mexico. The capital sort of has a state tax, and it's highly arguable that it's a real tax on las tenencias de los coches for those states that still have them, los impuestos sobre nómina, which are largely meaningless, and the pedial is a municipal tax. So, should, well, let's do it at a federal level. Why in the world should we give federal money in San Pedro Garza Garcia, which is the richest uh, uh, town in Mexico. I mean, like, why? Why should we give money from Oaxaca and Chiapas to San Pedro Garza Garcia? People would not like it. It wouldn't work. So these are real tough issues. They're not simple ones. But we have to spend more, and we have to make a decision instead of even definitely postpone them what kind of a security structure do we want? We want a military structure, we want a federal structure, we want a state structure, we want a municipal structure, or all of the above. Just one more question before going uh, different question. Uh, you, uh, I'm going back to your point about the, the DASO. Okay? So now, Claudia uh, Schoenbaum is not exactly the DASO, but uh, it was some kind of survey polls but it's not a primary either. So I very, most people, as you said, she's, she's, uh, she is here as a, the, pre, the incumbent president candidate, right? But as you said in your book, very brilliantly, so the, the, the DASO was not a way to order or to impose policy on the successor. It was more, it was more like a device to attract support to the incumbent president among all potential candidates, okay? Until the end of the six year term. But then when, once they were appointed or elected, they did whatever they wanted. So they, they were not uh, obliged to do whatever the former president wanted to do. Would something like this happen with uh, Claudia Schambaum and the case that she won? Of course, she may not win. But I mean, she may have so broad room to do her own policies or something different, or is the Morena's party more constraining? Or if the Morena has not a majority in Congress, would she be more open to cooperate with the opposition? How do you think so? Well, I, I, I mean, I'll answer your question by answering my second question that I left you with, because I don't want to make believe that I don't want to answer it. Uh, unlike most of my colleagues, and meaning uh, columnists and political scientists and uh, the chattering classes, uh, in Mexico, I do not believe in the thing that if she wins, he will just go home. And if he doesn't go home, then once he is sitting in the presidential chair in the equivalent of the Oval Office, uh, con la banda puesta, blah, 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 she will get rid of him like all Mexican presidents got rid of their predecessors. I don't believe that, and I don't believe it for political and social reasons not psychiatric ones, of which, for which I know very little. What do I mean by this? I mean that López Obrador will be the first Mexican president since Lázaro Cárdenas, and even then, that's arguable. He will leave office 
with a significant social base, with a social political constituency of his own that he didn't acquire because of the job he had, because of the position he had, la investidura, no. He brought it to the presidency, he kept it during his presidency, and by he means he will take it with him. This will be the first president since Cárdenas, and as I said, Cárdenas is arguable, because Cárdenas left in 1940 as a quite an unpopular president, except with, the, with organized labor, and the peasantry to which he distributed land. But he was so unpopular, unpopular that in fact his candidate, Manuel Avila Camacho, probably lost the election. They had to resort to widespread electoral fraud in order to get Avila Camacho elected. But that's a historical distinction. Let's forget about Cárdenas. López Obrador moved with an enormous social base. And he will use it. Now, he won't use it just for the hell of it. He'll use it on the issues that he is concerned about. For example, energy. For example, the judicial branch. For example, the social programs. For example, his white elephant, uh, pharaonic public works. Uh, for example, a series of policies of not... Uh, conceding to the private sector a number of questions or areas of the economy, etc. Now, if she does what he wants because she knows what he wants and she does it on her own, that's fine, then he'll be quiet. He's not interested in being the people visibly. No, he's fine. As long as she does what he wants, he's okay. Now, if she starts doing things that he doesn't want, then yes, I think he'll bring out that social base and make life miserable for Claudia Sheinbaum if she were to win. But I want to emphasize this. I am not at all one of the people who are willing to concede the election before time, but I know many of my colleagues are conceding it before time. That's their choice and their right to do so. I, I don't. Great. So let's start with questions, please. Uh, introduce yourself, you first. Uh, uh, hi. Um, Hold on one second, please. A little lower. Good afternoon, Don Castañeda. It's an honor having you here today. Uh, my name is uh, Andres. I'm a master's student in the Foreign Service Program. And uh, my question is, for somebody who's such a mastermind of Mexican political co culture, a guru like uh, the current president, how is it that he slipped up in creating his uh, own sort of worst enemy by sort of building up uh, Senator Xochitl, who was not really a figure until he started putting the spotlight on her? How did he not see that coming? Well, let, let, let's put it this way. Uh, there are different interpretations of when she decided to run and why she decided to run. The conventional uh, wisdom in Mexico is that she wanted to run for uh, mayor of Mexico City, uh, but she uh, had sued López Obrador to be able to be granted the right of reply to an accusation he made. And he refused, and she got a judge's warrant to be able to reply in the morning press conference. And he didn't let her in, and she was banging on the door, and he didn't let her in. And so there she has a sort of epiphany, and she decided to run for president. And that from there on, he built her up. Okay. I don't necessarily agree with that interpretation. Uh, the impression I have, I don't necessarily know any secrets, but the impression I have is that she had made the decision to run before that episode at the presidential palace, that he was caught totally off guard. He had, that's what I thought, had made a statement three or four days before she announced her candidacy that he was going to tell us who the opposition candidate was, and we do know that the person he thought was going to be the candidate 
was who everybody thought at that time was going to be the candidate, it was Santiago Carrillo. Uh, and uh, so that's what he thought, and of course he was wrong. And when she suddenly declares her candidacy, he was caught totally off guard and contributed, yes, partly to, um, let's say, make her more visible, although, although by going after her from the very beginning, he probably made the right decision in terms of already portraying her or being the one who uh, portrays her to most of the people in his way, instead of her being able to define herself, he defined her from the very beginning. And he did so very skillfully, um, not unlike what Fox did to him back in 2006, in which Fox, I think, was also correct in having done so in terms of pure political tactics. Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm an undergrad in the School of Foreign Service. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that Pri and Pan are much disliked and that PRD is basically non-existent. These, the, Al the Alianza, are supposed to be the opposition, hence don't you believe there needs to be a party that stands as a new and genuine opposition like Movimiento Ciudadano? Well, yes, I would love that. But uh, that's not what Movimiento Ciudadano is, unfortunately. I wish it were. But in my opinion, it is not. And it is not because if it were an opposition party, a uh, sincerely convinced opposition party, it would understand or they would understand that this is not an election like any other, that this is, as I said, not an election between two candidates on an equal footing, and where you can say, well, a plague on both your houses, uh, I want to offer a third solution. No, this is an election, if you want, like Biden would put it here in the United States, between uh, democracy and an authoritarian uh, drift or slippery slope, whichever term you prefer. I mean, Lopez Obrador's authoritarian tendencies and temptations, I think, are unmistakable. Whether they are carried through to the end or not, we can argue about, but I think it's very clear that they are there. And so if what you were, if Movimiento Ciudadano were what you would say, first they would be in opposition. They could, I, I remember, I mean, I, I, I was at a lunch at Dante Delgado's house, something like, I don't know, a week or so, two weeks before Xochitl Galvez announced her candidacy. And I had the feeling, let's leave it at that, that she was going to be a candidate. The feeling, not more. Okay. And I told Dante, look, I have a feeling that Xochitl is going to be, is going to run for the presidency, not for mayor of Mexico City. Why don't you nominate her first? And then the others are supporting your candidate. She's a magnificent candidate. And the others will then support her, but they will not support, they will support your candidate, not their candidate. This is a win-win for you. Maybe, but we know people, never, no andamos mendigando candidaturas. We're not begging for candidacies. Estás completamente mal, ya mejor no digas nada. Shut up. <laughs> Quickly translated. Uh, that's not an opposition party in, in my view, quite, quite honestly. Even though there are very decent, honest, and opposition people in the party, some of which are very good friends of mine. No, okay, then, then, yeah. Yes. Thank you for being here. Um, you belong to an administration that is remembered historically for debunking the PRI out of Los Pinos and having a fierce critic of PRI governments throughout your work. Um, so, with the, announce, the announcement of the birth of the Puente Amplio, were you in favor of the PRI and the PRN actually coming together? Um, I'm also thinking about like Movimiento Ciudadano. What is the Movimiento Ciudadano in this election? 
and what did a candidacy of Samuel Garcia reveal about Dante Edgardo? And then lastly, um, how will the oldest uh, hurricane and disaster in Puerto change the election? Well, that's already three. <laughs> let, let me find those three and then find out because then I'll forget. Uh, first on, you know, I am no fan of the P. I I never have been and I probably never will be, but I think that this is an election not between parties or candidates, but between the future of Mexican democracy or a regression to some form of authoritarian rule, not unlike we, what we lived before. And, you know, you have strange bedfellows. Yes, uh, I am not comfortable uh, if I were uh, a candidate for Congress or for the Senate or something like that and have the people around me at a rally, I would not feel comfortable. But I think that that's the right thing to do. And I think, by the way, without the P, if the PAN had run alone, it would have no chance whatsoever to win the election. There is a, this is a long shot, but there is a possibility for the alliance and Xochitl to win. Uh, on Samuel Garcia, I mean, I think that if this happens, clearly this is something that either explicitly or tacitly has been agreed upon by Lopez Obrador and Dante Delgado and Samuel Garcia as a way of stealing votes for Sochi, or at least stealing the spotlight. If not votes, at least the spotlights, uh, momentum, innovation, novelty, etc. And that this will be damaging to her candidacy. How damaging, I don't know. As I said before, I'm not convinced that at the end of the road, it will be that relevant. But certainly at the beginning, it can be. And on the question of Acapulco, it, it's hard to say. I haven't seen any polls yet, uh, and I'm not sure I would rely on polls. My impression, but it really is a totally impressionistic uh, conclusion. I have no real grounds for it. My impression is that this did damage Lopez Obrador, that it did harm him that people saw him as unresponsive, unsympathetic, unempathetic, un uh, uh, indifferent, uh, as, as of today, at least maybe tonight, but as of today, we have not seen one single video or photograph of him in Acapulco with the people, with the people without houses, without this, without that, or at a funeral, or handing out water, whatever, any, any one of the million kinds of pictures that all presidents have taken of themselves in all countries when something like this happened. Not one single picture. It's been two weeks now. I don't know if he's right in doing that or not. It's not very nice. But forget nice. That's he's not in the business of being nice. I think he's wrong. I think that politically this will hurt him. But I tell you, this, this is very impressionistic. I have no real uh, grounds for for affirming this. Ahora sí hay atrás tantito. Why you didn't collect that two or three questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Senor Castaneda. Uh, my question was more about the future of the parties in Mexico. Uh, we have seen Morena become more the party of Lopez Obrador, they were always the party of Lopez Obrador, but the opposition parties have banded together to form this strange coalition. Going forward, um, especially well, first, on the case that Shinbam wins, uh, we will see the identity of the PRI, the PAN, and the PRD completely disappear so that they fuse together into a coordinated opposition, or will they continue to infight, and will that lead to a victory of Morena again um, in the Congress? Or in the case of a Societal Guidance victory, will the opposition parties regain their identity as sort of separate parties, and we will see again a multi party system arise in Mexico? Will you be I don't know. No, you can. You can go a little further back, so we're. <laughs> 
My question is not based on, on the, the parties. My question is more of a structural question. And that is, we're very limited about any situation between the executive and the legislative branch right now, with the judiciary under siege and some of our other practical powers, not the traditional ones. But perhaps, the, for example, our constitutionally autonomous organisms. What happens? when there's an election next year, do you consider that we have uh, established enough institutions in, in Mexico for them to come and in Russia and, and continue and actually do their job within the context of, of the election? Um, or do you think that they will necessarily follow the, the party that, that gets to power or, or perhaps not become a, a defense of our institutions themselves. Yeah. Hang on a second. Uh, on the, your question here in front, I mean, firstly, um, if, if Shane Baum wins, uh, there will probably be uh, an implosion of the alliance, the opposition alliance. They are together basically because they think they have a better chance of winning or of gaining seats together than separately. Uh, once they lose whatever they may have picked up in the Congress or in the governorships, probably the alliance will up to a point disintegrate. Uh, and of course, the main danger, if you like, is that uh, the government, will Morena, will be able to buy off a sufficient number of pre uh, congressmen and senators to make up a majority, a simple majority if they don't have it, and a constitutional majority if they have a simple majority but don't have a constitutional majority. Because by then, it would be much more difficult in a second term to have the pre not follow its natural inclination, which is to go in that direction. Um, if Xochitl wins, I think the first point that's interesting is that they do seem to agree uh, with this notion of a coalition government. It's not clear exactly what it means. Uh, my good friends of mine, like Krill and Beltrones, have been obsessed with putting this in the Constitution for years now. I never understood what for. In other words, you can do it without having it in the constitution but you know in mexico we like to have everything we're cooking recipes we like to put them in the constitution we're strange people but anyway uh, i think that uh, they have a notion that they want to govern together and not just the three parties but also a broader alliance that includes all of these groups of so-called organized civil society. And so I think that, yes, uh, that would probably happen if she wins the presidential election. It is very likely that the alliance of Frente will have a simple majority in both the House and the Senate, not a constitutional majority, but a, a majority. And that, I think, there would be a reasonable chance of them governing reasonably, uh, nothing spectacular, but reasonably. And I think this is a much better alternative for the country than the opposite. On the question of the institutions, look, I, I don't have much faith in the strength of Mexican institutions. Uh, and the reason I don't have much faith in them is that uh, they're very young. And uh, yes, with all due respect, as what the Sobrador would say <laughs> to many of you, on the respect that that is not necessarily a virtue as far as institutions are concerned. Um, I know the, the Biden administration, for example, has tried to avoid so many things about all of the authoritarian trends that we have seen in Mexico, constantly saying, well, but we believe in Mexican institutions and they are... Uh, uh, surviving and they are fighting back and they are 
uh, putting limits uh, on uh, whatever may be happening in Mexico. I don't believe that. Particularly, I don't believe it, of course, if Morena were to have a two-thirds majority in both houses, or if they had a majority whereby they could buy off enough penal votes to build that majority if they don't have it. And I also don't believe, you know, I mean, we have seen even some way down concrete case, which was not enough. They tried a second one. It didn't work. But the first one worked. Was they blackmailed Eduardo uh, Medina Mora, justice, Supreme Court justice, into resigning. They blackmailed him. It was sure, sheer blackmail. They froze his bank accounts. They threatened to throw his kids and his brothers in jail and throw him in jail. And so chicken out. Now, I am a chicken too. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not blaming him at all. Uh, I, I wouldn't, have been, I wouldn't have accepted to be a Supreme Court justice if I thought that I was going to chicken out. But that's a different discussion. They blackmailed and he caved. Well, you know, no es un país de héroes, eh? We don't, we don't do that in Mexico. We have other things. We're very good at That's not one of them. No es un país de héroes. And if you ask the, the, the uh, Banco de Mexico people, or the Inu people, or the Inu people, who really stand up to major offensives, they're not going to do it. It's just not the way the country is, not yet. 50 years from now, maybe. Now, I don't think so. Quite honestly, I don't I don't believe so. Just one more question. I think we have time for at least one answer. Esa, esa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Castaneda. My name is Manuel Carrasco from Cuernavaca. Um, just a, a question from Economic and Social Balance. What do you consider the biggest challenges in achieving a balance between economic efficiency and social equity in Mexico in case either such the wins or uh, Claudia Sheva wins? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in a normal circumstance, in democracy, you can lose or win. What we are facing in the next election in Mexico is that we may lose democracy in an election. Uh, we see that the, uh, in the US, Mexico's democracy is not even in the list of priorities. Everybody talks about immigration, human trafficking, fentanyl, and violence. I mean, how would you suggest for Mexicans to put Mexico in the agenda? Of, if not violence administration, at least at the Congress level. Any thoughts? Thank you. Well, uh, I'll answer the second question first and then come back to the first one, which is really a fundamental question. Not the, the other one isn't. And I'll also answer my own question in response to your question. I am convinced that if Xochitl uh, wins by a couple of points, uh, Lopez Obrador will not accept the result. I don't think he will. What he will do exactly, I have no idea, but I don't think he will just sit back and say, oh, well, too bad, uh, perdimos pollo, as they used to say uh, a long time ago in the 1950s about a guy who lost, not, was not picked by the, the lasso. Uh, I, I don't think so. And that's why I think that, yes, you're right, this is not just a simple election. It is an election where uh, a lot of things that we have built up in Mexico over the last uh, 30 years uh, are at play or at stake, and um, we could use them. And I do think that the United States is a major factor, but unfortunately, the Biden administration and most of the Democrats in the Congress, by the way, not the Republicans, but they have their own reasons, which are not necessarily very noble always. Uh, the Biden administration has basically said, look, and, and look, as well, has been very skillful at this. He's been very, very uh, intelligent on this. Said, look, you do the dirty work for them and keep all these people out, and you can do whatever the hell you want. Uh, you want to uh, 
this story, long situations, you want to spend a lot on this, you want to build an airport, you want to land at your airport, a land at your airport, you want to get, bring my car to the airport, go back on a big road and everything. Can you imagine what shape Biden's level scene was in after having to go on dirty roads from you know, Santa Lisa and Polanco? I mean, they probably had to buy one in one. I think they did, I mean, quite honestly. Uh, Biden has accepted everything as long as Lopez Obrador keeps the migrants out, which he hasn't done, of course, but Biden could reasonably think, well, it would have been much worse if he hadn't done anything. So let's do this. What can people do? It's very difficult to bring Mexican democracy, put Mexican democracy on the agenda with the United States. I think with the Biden administration, it's practically impossible. With the Congress, there are people who are willing to listen. There are people who are willing to get be interested. There have been delegations, congressional delegations that have gone to Mexico, senators, uh, congressmen, congresswomen, etc. There is a problem because the Republicans do it for their own crazy reasons. They want to bomb the labs in Sinaloa and crazy stuff like that. It's very difficult for them to get terribly excited about Mexican democracy. They don't they don't care about their own democracy, so why should they worry about Mexico's? Uh, and in the case of the Democrats, you have a, a real problem, which is that the most progressive Democrats, at least in the House, are to be fans of López Obrador. A guy like Bernie Sanders or Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, etc., they tend to be sympathetic. Uh, it's very difficult to explain to them that that's not the way it is. So I think it's a huge challenge, and I myself don't know very well how to go about it. Uh, what the gentleman from Cuernavaca uh, brought up, uh, I, I think, is really the, the key question. The problem is that we really haven't had either under López Obrador. I grant you that we haven't had a great deal of either under the previous presidents dating back let's say, to Salinas onward, uh, we haven't had the levels of growth that everyone promised, or economic efficiency, if that's what you want to call it, but I just call it pure and simple economic growth. And we haven't had inclusion, or social inclusion, or social equity, whatever you want to call it. We've had an important reduction in poverty over the last 40 years, yes, so 30 years, yes, we have, but this is still far from being an inclusive society. So the question then becomes, what can you do, what could any government do to try and bring about a little more of both, given that if you don't grow, uh, your inclusion is going to be highly unsatisfactory if you get it. It's a little bit what Lopez Obrador has done. He's gotten a little bit, so it seems, of less inequality, but at the cost, or maybe not at the cost, but simultaneously with practically zero or even negative GDP per capita growth in his six years. So the next government's challenge, obviously, is to do both things, to grow seriously and to be more inclusive. Now, there are a number of people who have proposed a number of things you can argue on the detail of them, but clearly one of the more important suggestions that people like Xochitl Galvez and many others have come up with has to do with some kind of universal social safety net for Mexico, which we don't have. We have an enormous amount of people who are unprotected, unprotected in the sense they don't have access to health care, they don't have access to decent pensions, they don't have access to any kind of unemployment insurance, they don't have access to daycare centers, et cetera, for women, for children, et cetera. So, you know, creating a modern safety net, a full-fledged real safety net, social safety net in Mexico, a universal social safety net, is probably the most important goal that any administration should have. I'll end by saying probably Lopez Obrador's worst sin, and you don't want to call it a crime, but sin was not doing this, seeing as how he had the political capital to carry out the kind of tax reform that you have to carry out, you have to implement 
in order to build the social safety net. And I know we can argue for years, and there are people who thought, know far more about this than I do, like Alejandro, uh, how much this cost does it cost? Two points of GDP, five points of GDP, whatever the hell it costs. sales tax reform to pay for it. You need to do it, and you need tax reform in order to pay for it. We can argue, as I say, how much. Lopez Obrador had the first real opportunity because he had the political capital to do it, to carry out significant several points, three, four, five points over the entire administration of tax reform. And he wouldn't do it. This nonsense, there was a Tesoro de Moctezuma of 500 billion pesos hidden somewhere that todo lo que se robaban. Which is, I mean, the que se lo robaban, sí. That it was sitting there just waiting for somebody to go and pick it up. No. Precisely because, yes, a lot of it was robado. It was not sitting there. It was here or in Switzerland or some other place. But it wasn't just sitting there waiting for him to pick it up. And he decided not to try to implement any kind of tax reform. And this, I think, is the worst sin of his administration. Or if you want to go further than calling it a sin, it's a crime. Well, we could follow for hours, I think, because it has been very interesting. I think you could agree that we have a lot of information, insights, things to keep thinking about it. So thank you, Dr. Castaneda, very much again. And uh, so let's cheer about it.